Welcome to the 700 Club. For a year and a half, most of the media dismissed reports about Hunter Biden's laptop as a non-issue or Russian disinformation. Well, a few weeks ago, they began to acknowledge that the story is real. Many people are wondering why the sudden change. Well, one possibility, Hunter Biden could soon be indicted. Dale Hurd has more on this growing scandal. In the weeks before the 2020 presidential election, CNN was calling the Hunter Biden laptop story a manufactured scandal. The New York Times congratulated itself for not doing the story, calling it misinformation. National Public Radio said, we don't waste our time on stories that are not really stories. The Atlantic magazine called it a right-wing media smear. And the newspaper that broke the story, the New York Post, had its Twitter account suspended. Now, suddenly, major news organizations have decided it's a story. Well, Brianna, this is a very real, very substantial investigation of potentially serious federal crimes. After also largely ignoring the story, the Washington Post now says the media faces a reckoning for suppressing accurate and relevant stories. So why are some in the media finally admitting that Hunter Biden's laptop exists? One theory is that indictments are coming. Just three weeks before the 2020 presidential election, the New York Post reported the discovery of an abandoned laptop belonging to Joe Biden's son, Hunter. It was at a repair shop in Delaware. It contained hundreds of emails appearing to detail a multi-million dollar influence peddling scheme by the Biden family. In one email, the big guy, believed to be a reference to Joe Biden, is mentioned as possibly getting a 10% cut on a deal with a Chinese energy firm. Other emails showed Hunter Biden introduced the then vice president to a Ukrainian energy executive less than a year before Joe Biden pressured the Ukrainian government to fire a prosecutor who was investigating the company. An April 2015 email reads in part, Dear Hunter, thank you for inviting me to D.C. and giving me an opportunity to meet your father and spend some time together. Another read, don't mention Joe being involved. It's only when you are face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. Former U.S. Attorney Brett Tolman, now the executive director of Right on Crime, told us the Hunter Biden case is a prosecutor's dream and that if Hunter's last name wasn't Biden, he would have been indicted before the 2020 election. Almost any U.S. attorney that looks at this would be looking at this as a as a scheme and a conspiracy, which is a standalone federal crime. Tolman says he would have immediately executed search warrants on the financial records of the Biden family, including Joe and Jill Biden. I would have secured FISA warrants, wanted to see, you know, what we are dealing with, what kind of money is coming in to an individual that could compromise, you know, the highest levels of our government. Joe and Hunter Biden have stated repeatedly that the then vice president had no involvement in his son's foreign business dealings. I want to get to the heart of it. Did you and your father ever discuss Ukraine? No. As I said, the only time was after a news account. It wasn't a discussion in any way. There's no but to this. No, we never did. Your dad said, I hope you know what you're doing. I hope you know you what said, you're doing. It, I do. And I said, I do. And that was literally the end of our discussion. The major media narrative now seems to be that while the allegations against Hunter Biden are serious, none of this implicates his father. On ABC's This Week, White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain, to borrow a phrase, appeared to throw Hunter Biden under the bus. These are actions by uh, Hunter and his brother. They're private matters. They don't involve the president, and they certainly are something that no one at the White House is involved in. Newsweek opinion editor Josh Hammer accuses some in the media and big tech of influencing the outcome of the 2020 election by spiking the story. All this was transpiring, by the way, about three to four weeks, less than a month away from a monumental presidential election. So it seems like, to me, they're covering their butts on the one hand, while on the other hand, 
they're probably scared. And I think that they probably don't want Joe Biden to get impeached over this. So they're trying to, I think, finagle this kind of middle ground approach. That's my that's my best read of the situation, at least. Award-winning journalist Peter Boyer, who has worked at the New York Times as well as The New Yorker and in television, said media outlets didn't do the story simply because they didn't like it or the effect it could have on the election. The excuse they used at the time was that they couldn't verify it which is, of course, a load of hogwash. They said, uh, no, we're not going to cover this story. Uh, we don't like people who are associated with this story. We're not crazy about the effect this story might have, so we're not gonna do it. An equal or bigger scandal than what was found on Hunter Biden's laptop could be how the mainstream media refused to report it until they had to. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, mainstream media has turned into a propaganda organ for the Democrat Party. Uh, and this isn't my own opinion. Uh, a U.S. federal judge has accused the New York Times and Washington Post of being adjuncts of the uh, Democrat Party. They're, that they're propaganda newspapers. They're, they're not news organizations. They're not trying to independently uh, give us information. They're trying definitely to slant it. And this isn't the only instance. The New York Times had that famous story of bounties, Russian bounties for Afghans who kill U.S. soldiers. And it turns out it was completely false, but that doesn't catch up. They were trying to score political points against a sitting president. Uh, that somehow he knew about the bounty program and wasn't doing anything about it. Uh, so the, 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 the people who vote, we all need to understand there's a lot of misinformation out there. And it's not just on one side. Uh, it's both sides. There's a, a book I encourage you to get. It's, a, it's four years old now. It's published back in 2018. It's called Profiles in Corruption. And it details both sides of this. Uh, there's an untold one that does involve Hunter Biden, uh, and it's out of the trip to China uh, where John Kerry's stepson uh, and Hunter Biden were on Air Force Two with Joe Biden. He was a sitting vice president. John Kerry was a secretary of state. And apparently the two sons walked away with business deals uh, after flying on Air Force Two. Uh, that, to me, just it doesn't pass the sniff test. Uh, and, and why is that allowed to happen? And why is that not being reported? And why aren't people being held accountable? Uh, and it all goes down to we have become so divided politically that we can't see straight anymore. Uh, and it's, it's all about, are you for this particular candidate? Are you against this particular candidate? And everybody wants to predict some kind of disaster if the other party gets in power. Uh, we can't have a, a unified approach to the future of the United States of America. And I'm frankly afraid for our democracy. Uh, the longer we continue down this highly partisan road, just trying to uh, convince 2% of the electorate to vote our way, uh, we're, we're, we're never going to come into agreement for the long-term future. When you look at the challenges that we face in the world today, the challenge of Ukraine, the challenge of North Korea, the challenge of Iran, the challenge of peace in the Middle East, the challenge of a COVID pandemic, you, the challenge of our economy, high energy prices, high inflation. You look at all of these things. If we can't come together and say, these are our problems, how do we, as the United States of America, solve them? How do we forge an agenda for our future? If we can't come into agreement because we're so concerned about scoring political points or covering up what is obvious wrongdoing, uh, I don't see a future for us. So can we pray for unity? Can we be one nation under God, indivisible? Now, with righteousness, uh, how about that? How about justice for all? How about if you're in power and you do something wrong, you're going to be held accountable? We're going to see that, and that's going to play out over the next few months. Uh, and please be in prayer for our nation. 
uh, please be in prayer for unity. How can we come together and, and, and get to a point where we can have some kind of an agreement? Terry? The first black female justice in the 223-year history of the Supreme Court. Ketanji Brown Jackson now holds that honor. Ketanji Brown Jackson will be hearing some important cases when she becomes the first black woman on the Supreme Court after being confirmed as expected by the Senate Thursday. All 50 Democrats, along with three Republicans, voted for her, although other Republicans had some reservations. Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka has the story. Well, the historical significance of the moment not overshadowed by any surprises as the Senate voted to turn Judge Jackson into Justice Jackson. The tally coming in at 53 to 47, with three Republican senators joining all Democrats and elevating Jackson to the high court. On this vote, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47, and this nomination is confirmed. There wasn't much drama around the actual vote, as many senators had already signaled their intentions to vote for Ketanji Brown Jackson's confirmation. Thursday's vote did provide both sides a final chance to get their points across in trying to sway their colleagues. Democrats emphasized the historic significance. Today is also a joyous celebration in another way. In the 233-year history of the Supreme Court, never, never has a black woman held the title of justice. Ketanji Brown Jackson will be the first, and I believe the first, of more to come. The outcome for the president's pick was expected, with only a simple majority vote needed and Democrats controlling the Senate chamber. Then came further assurance when Republican Senator Susan Collins stated she would vote for Jackson, the first GOP senator to do so. Senators Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski also signaled their support, giving the vote somewhat of a bipartisan feel after contentious hearings. Republicans focused on Jackson's experience and record on sentencing, specifically in some child pornography cases, during her nomination process. Some continued to make their case leading up to the vote. Personally speaking, she is bright, she is charming, she is talented, but her record is extreme, and it suggests a three-decade-long pattern of advocating for very, very lenient sentences for violent criminals and in particular for sex offenders. CBN's chief political analyst David Brody says Jackson will have big cases waiting for her when her term starts, one on religious freedom, another on affirmative action, which she vowed not to rule on. There's one big case, of course, on affirmative action that she won't even take part in because of her Harvard connections and she's recused herself already from that case, so that's going to be the big one. Jackson was watching the vote as it happened at the White House with President Biden. She'll officially take her place on the bench this summer when Justice Stephen Breyer retires. At the Capitol, Matt Galka, CBN News. All right, thank you, Matt. In Israel, another deadly terror attack for the fourth time in just over three weeks. As Chris Mitchell reports, this time it took place in the busy city of Tel Aviv, leaving two dead and more than a dozen wounded. On Thursday evening, a Palestinian gunman opened fire into a crowded restaurant in the heart of one of Tel Aviv's busiest sections. Our crew just came to the area and find a few people that just was shot. We start to help to try to save their life. After a massive manhunt, security forces found and killed the terrorist, a 28-year-old Palestinian from the West Bank town of Jenin. Hamas praised the terrorist attack but did not claim responsibility. After the attack, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett addressed the nation. Dear citizens, we're in a difficult and challenging period. It may be prolonged. The second intifada lasted several years, but in the end we won. The long wave of terror of 2015 and 2016 lasted over a year, costing us 50 murders, but in the end we won. This time too, we will win. The wave of terror attacks came just before and now during the observance of the Muslim month of Ramadan when religiously inspired attacks often increase. After the attack, some Palestinians gave out candy in Ramallah and in Gaza, others paraded in the street to celebrate the terror attack. In Tel Aviv, the Israeli Philharmonic interrupted their concert and played Israel's national anthem, Hatikva, The Hope. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Jerusalem. 
Thank you, Chris. Turning to Ukraine, where there's no let up in the brutality of Russia's war, this video from the Ukrainian president's office shows the aftermath of a rocket strike earlier today. It killed more than 30 people and wounded over 100 at a train station that was being used to evacuate civilians in the eastern part of the country. The governor of the Donetsk region said thousands of civilians were waiting at the station to evacuate when the rocket attack hit. That strike coming after Kremlin forces laid waste to a Ukrainian city in a different region. CBN's Brady Carter brings us that story. Devastation is all that's left for Ukrainian locals in the northern Ukrainian city of Chernihiv. Russian forces destroyed two-thirds of the city before leaving to regroup in eastern Ukraine. Valuable possessions, crushed buildings, and cars litter the streets. The locals are in dire need of food and other help. All this as the U.S. again pointing to Russian abuses against Ukrainian citizens. With each day, more and more credible reports of rape, killings, torture are emerging. Atrocities and alleged war crimes in Ukraine led the United Nations General Assembly to take the unprecedented action of kicking Russia off the U.N. Human Rights Council Thursday. On Capitol Hill, Congress passed two bills to officially ban the import of Russian oil while suspending normal trade relations. Now they just need the president's signature. And in Ukraine itself, growing concerns that Russia is about to launch another large offensive in the eastern Donbass region. Those reports spurred Kyiv to call on the West to send more help. My agenda is very simple. It has only three items on it. It's weapons, weapons, and weapons. NATO countries have agreed to send additional high-tech weapons, while U.S. congressional leaders debate whether to send future assistance and holding off on payment until later. We have not stopped, nor are we stopping providing additional security assistance. We have announcements nearly every couple of days. Ukraine's foreign minister warns just how destructive the coming warfare could be. The battle for Donbas will remind you of the Second World War. As the fighting continues, Ukrainian refugees continue to stream into Poland. More than 4.3 million Ukrainians have now fled the war-torn country, the majority of them entering through Poland. Brody Carter, CBN News. And as Ukrainian refugees flood across the border into Poland, CPN's Operation Blessing is there to greet them. Among the refugees, two women who spoke about how the war destroyed their village, their escape to Poland, and the warm welcome they received from Operation Blessing. We didn't believe it at first. When it all started, my younger brother knocked on the door and said the war had begun. We looked at him and said, what kind of war? Are you crazy? We're in the 21st century. It's impossible to have a war. But we were there when the bombs started flying in Kiev. Then we believed. Natasha and Dasha hid with their families as the war raged around them. Our defenses couldn't hold them back. There were a lot of soldiers and they stopped in our village. Then the lights and gas went out. People were scared and panicking. Many of us hid in our basements. There were explosions everywhere and machine gun fire. After a few days, it was clear to Natasha and Dasha that they needed to escape, but Russian soldiers blocked their path. There was a way where you could walk or go by car. And at the beginning, the soldiers allowed us to go to where our army was. But later, they closed this road and didn't allow us to go. We tried to leave the village three or four times. Finally, the two women made it safely to Poland, but they grieve over the life they left behind. Today, I received a call from my grandfather, who lives in my house. He did not want to leave the village, but now he has. He said, the village is no more. It was fully destroyed. The bombs hit people's houses indiscriminately. Our hope is that this will end soon and we'll be reunited with other families. It's very hard to get away from it all. Thanks to the support of Operation Blessing Partners, we have teams on the ground helping provide support to many refugees like Natasha and Dasha. There is so much help provided for us. We came filled with fear and didn't know where to go. But people here understand. They're getting involved in helping us. This is good. 
Millions of refugees trying to escape desperate and deadly situations. Gordon? And you can help them. How? By giving to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. It's real easy. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. You can write to us at CBN Center. Uh, there's the address, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. You can text, text to give, text the OB crisis to 71777, or you can go to CBN.com. Either way, do it now. Be a part of helping those refugees. They're leaving with literally nothing. Uh, they have no way of making any income in Poland or the other countries in Europe they're going to. Um, and they need our help. So how can we be there for them? How can we provide food? How can we provide water, shelter? These are the vital things that they need. Infant formula for the babies. How can we be there? We can be there in your name when you give to this wonderful fund to help the, the, the victims of this horrible war. If you want to be a part of it, Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Tara? Playing the piano by ear at the age of five, writing songs when she was seven, Kira Fontana was born to perform music. As a young adult, she moved to Los Angeles with the dream of becoming a pop star. Then a critic shot her down, and Kira's world was shattered. My life was music. It was my purpose. It was my self-worth. It was everything. Kira Fontana's passion for music started when she was a little girl. Learning to play piano by ear at five and writing songs at seven, she was a natural. And as a young Catholic girl, she came to believe it was part of God's plan. I would literally pray by my bedside every night, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do. I just wanted to serve. Music also became an escape from a sometimes difficult home life that ended in her parents' divorce. It had given me purpose out of a childhood that was very painful. So I didn't have anything, but I had the music. Kira pursued her dreams with enthusiasm and went on to earn a master's in composition at Yale. Recognized as an accomplished pianist, singer, and songwriter, she released her first album in 2007. And while her music explored spiritual, positive themes, she had begun to question her beliefs about God. There were certain things that I just felt like I had to go a different direction, but I did seek God. Now, looking back, I go, okay, is it the God of the Bible? I was confused on certain things. Then in her early 30s, Kira moved to LA, ready to make a splash in the pop music industry. Her music and her creative vision, however, received a chilly reception, the worst coming from a higher up in the music industry. This is meaning of life stuff. Nobody wants to hear this. You need to write about this. You need to be the next this person. And I just got the message. Nobody wants what you have to offer. A depression sunk in like nothing I'd ever felt. It's like I had no sense of purpose anymore. I stopped writing, I stopped singing. She did, however, find work as a vocal coach and started working with top talent from around the world. That only made the pain of failure that much harder to swallow. They had what I thought I wanted, and so it was like this extra in my face all the time. Not only do you not have it, but you're going to watch everybody else have it all the time. To cope with her disappointment and shattered dreams, Kira dove deeper into her spiritual search, exploring meditation and Eastern mysticism. Eventually, she started attending a spiritual center in LA to pursue truth through greater enlightenment. I let go of all concepts of Jesus, of the devil, of evil. God is more of a universal force of goodness and love and light. I'm meditating to feel more peace. I'm meditating to transcend the things I don't like about my environment, because I think that's the goal. I'm seeking God in the way that I understand. It was all she had left. Here I was with the one thing left that made me feel safe in the world, that gave me purpose and identity. So the music had died, and then I found that in the spirituality. Then in 2016, Akira heard a different version of truth. Her two brothers had been sharing their newfound faith in Jesus Christ, 
she remembers one of them challenging her to examine her beliefs. There was absolutely something spiritual in me that hated what he was saying. And I said, Jesus is a great spiritual teacher. Jesus was very enlightened, you know, whatever my new age of view of Jesus was. And I literally had the gall to say, I just try to live like Jesus lived. I'm not out drinking and partying and this and that. So you might need that, but I don't. I thought that I knew truth. And I thought they were kind of stumbling around in the darkness and kind of found something that worked for them. And I thought they were sinners. And I thought I wasn't. There was one person she would listen to, her mother. She had also given her life to Christ. Would you just pray to see truth? Just pray to see truth. And I said, that I can do. I did it over and over. And if there is anything to this Jesus thing, that he would show me who Jesus is. Kira says as she prayed over the next year, God did show her the truth about himself and her need for a savior. So she stopped going to the spiritual center and started attending church and a Bible study. One sermon made Kira realize her search all those years had more to do about her than God. Everything I'd ever focused on was me. I've fallen so short of what God would want. I just said, I hope you pull me out of this. Like, I'm willing to walk through this darkness, but I hope you pull me out of it because I can't pull myself out. I was finally ready to let him take over. And when I gave my life to Jesus, it was a very serious thing for me. Over the next few months, Kira prayed for God's direction for her life. He redeemed every area of my life that had been broken everything I'd ever lost. That included her music. Following God's lead, Kira started an independent Christian music label and started writing and recording worship music, finding fulfillment and pointing others to Jesus Christ. You're my refuge. All of my lost purpose, I got back, but it wasn't the worldly tiny purpose I had. It was like, no, you're alive to serve me. You're alive to glorify me. And it blew my whole world open and everything finally made sense. You're my refuge. Now, I think all of us at some point in time in our lives, sometimes when we're younger, sometimes when we're older, search for some kind of meaning, some, some answer to why are we here? What is this life all about? And the crazier the world around you gets, the more significant that question becomes. You know, God is always, always extending his arms to us, but so often we have to do what Kira did. She said, I finally was at the place where I was ready to surrender, where I was ready to really accept God's it. He's here. What am I gonna do about that? You know, if you're somebody who has pursued success in your own life, and don't we all do that to some degree? Who doesn't want that? But it can become an idol, not just an idol, it can become a stumbling block to really finding out what is your purpose. The Bible tells us that we're created in the image and likeness of God, that God creates us with intention. Do you know God's purpose for your life? You can, you know. It's not all wrapped up in a pretty box with a bow on top and instructions on how to use it because he wants us to stay close to him. He wants us to have the kind of relationship that trusts him enough to let him reveal every single day, what's today's truth? What's today's journey? What am, where am I taking you today? He is with us always. He is truth. So we can trust him in all circumstances. You know, when we're out there doing our own thing, we're pretty much exactly where Kira was. It's all about us. When Christ comes into our lives, that's one of the biggest changes that happens. My life's not all about me anymore. Before that, everything that we do is help me find out why I'm here. What's my purpose? Make me happy. I need this. I need that. And then... We come to a moment like this where you hear someone share that the answer is 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he has been there all the time. So today, if you're struggling with this, if you're struggling with what is truth, if you're struggling with what is my purpose, I'm not talking about what job are you going to have. I'm talking about a bigger picture than that. Why are you here? I invite you to do what Kira did, what so many of us have done. Come to the Savior and say, there you are, and here I am. And today, I want to know that I belong to you. I want to know that you have plan and purpose and intention for my life, and I want you to lead me in that. I am a sinner. You know, one of the things that, that maybe is at the heart of all of us that is sin is that thing that keeps pushing us away from God, pushing us to do our own thing, pushing us to always look inward. Today, look up. Look up to him and say, God, I give it all to you. I am a sinner. Forgive my sin. Forgive my willingness to separate from you. And today, teach me how to love you. Teach me how to hear you. Teach me how to walk with you. Come into my heart and my life. Be the Lord and Savior of my soul. I receive you, Jesus. If you pray a prayer like that, then you've begun a journey, an adventure really, a God adventure that unfolds with each day. But how do you walk that out? Well, we have a little pamphlet, it's not a pamphlet, it's a packet for you called A New Day that's filled with information on what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus and, and what are the steps you take to grow in your faith. This is our gift to you, it's free. The phone call is free too. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I'd like that new day packet. We'll get it out to you right away. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Prayer is still desperately needed in Ukraine, and you can be a part of the effort. Go to cbn.com slash pray for Ukraine to register for an exclusive live prayer event Saturday morning at 10 Eastern Daylight Time. Taking part will be Christian World News anchor Wendy Griffith, who will bring you the latest on how CBN's team is helping victims of the war in Ukraine and then lead in prayer. Well, Operation Blessing is helping children and adults around the world get the surgeries they need. At 13, Sully Hadi in Indonesia suffered with a cataract in her right eye that made it hard for her to see. Over time, she could only recognize light and small movements. Her parents couldn't afford the surgery she needed, but through a crowdfunding campaign that's part of Operation Blessing's life-changing surgeries program, generous friends raised the $2,000 to pay for the surgery in just under two weeks. Doctors did the surgery, and now Solihati's on her way to growing healthy and strong. You can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. Dallas A earns a living picking through garbage at a dump. She hunts for items she can recycle on good nut days. And those are few. She earned the $3. And that was before COVID. Now she makes next to nothing. Here on a garbage dump site in the Philippines, Dalase spends seven days a week scavenging for items she can recycle. Sometimes I can earn about $3. Other days, only a little more than $2. Dalase is a widow raising her children alone. The family's desperate situation was made even worse when the government enforced social distancing at the site due to COVID-19. Dallas's time collecting items was cut in half, and so was her income. For a while, they had to live on a dollar a day. It was not enough to buy food, so I just found some wild plants and boiled them. Mostly, we just ate a little rice. When Operation Blessing learned about the emergency situation, we sent a team with food packs to help more than 40 families working at the site. The food packs contain staples like bread, canned goods, and rice, along with hygiene kits and hand cleaner. I am happy because we really had no food left, nothing. My children and I are so thankful for the help you gave us. I am grateful to Operation Blessing. And they're grateful to you if you're a member of the 700 Club because you're part of that outreach. You're a part of everything we're doing around the world. How? A portion of every gift to the 700 Club goes into the work of Operation Blessing to do more than just give handouts, but we want to give hand up so that you can have a hope, people can have a future, 
the dignity of earning their own livelihood. It's wonderful what happens when people get together and say, let's do good. Let's do good for people, whether they're trash pickers in a dump outside of Manila or they're Ukrainian refugees. Let's be a part of helping people. If that's you, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's just $20 a month. That's 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have $40 a month. We have $84 a month. We also have 2500 Club. We also have Founder, $5,000 a year. And then we have Chairman Circle, $10,000 or more a year. At whatever level God is speaking to you to be a part of, do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Five hard-hitting tackles in the first half of the game. Then the linebacker for Tennessee State seemed to vanish. Here's what happened to him and how it led to a miracle he never saw coming. We were very excited about the game. It was like any normal, you know, Saturday. September 29th, 2018. College football is in full swing. That day, Derek and Stacy Abercrombie drove from their home in Atlanta to Nashville to cheer on their son Christian, a linebacker for Tennessee State. TSU faced in-town rival Vanderbilt a game that would permanently change Christian's life. When the game started, he was excited. He, I seen him bouncing around. It was very crowded. Um, it was hot. We were just excited, and then it changed. Christian was a highly touted prospect out of Atlanta's Westlake High School. He received nearly 30 Division I scholarship offers. His dream was to play in the NFL. He was a pretty big kid, and I've been around football a while to know the, the NFL caliber. Yeah, I had those thoughts in my head that he could make it. During the game, he was making plays, but he looked like he's kind of sluggish. He's out there, he's playing, but he's just not looking his normal speed. During the first half, Christian made five hard-hitting tackles. I found out something was wrong after halftime, and I looked in the area where the defensive players were located, and I did not see Christian. At that time, I began to um, kind of panic a little bit. The Abercrombies learned that Christian had collapsed and was rushed to Vanderbilt Hospital. When the nurse came in and she said that he was very ill and I needed to sign the consent forms because he's had a head injury, um, I was very puzzled and confused and I began to question her, you know, how did it happen? And she didn't have any answers other than we need to get him to surgery. Yeah, it was kind of something that we, you know, thought we'll never hear. Christian had suffered a traumatic brain injury and required a craniotomy, a removal of a piece of skull to relieve pressure on his brain. The Abercrombies met with the surgeon. He's telling us, you know, he may not wake up, and he's given us the medical terminology of what occurred to Christian. And I remember, you know, we cried, and I kind of fell on the floor a little bit. The operation was successful, but Christian was still in a coma. We was like, OK, that's enough. It's time to pray. We got to give it to God. We have to surrender. There's nothing that we can do that can change him. And at that moment, mm -hmm. It just changed our entire perspective. Our prayer was, you know, Jesus, get us through, you know, give him life. And we saying whatever that we can say that would give him any help through prayer. Derek and Stacy sent out an urgent message for friends and family to pray. And they were amazed by the response. There were hundreds of people in the waiting area, couldn't even fit in the chapel praying. And that was just a moment for me to say, it's not me, it's not about me, it's about God and what he can do. After nearly three long weeks, Christian awoke from his coma. I heard him kind of grunt. So I looked at him in the face and he was looking at me and I asked him, I said, can you hear me? Can you talk? And he looked at me and he kind of whispered, yes. Stacy says Christian's recovery is nothing short of miraculous. Oh, it was totally all a miracle. Um, from the surgeon um, stating it himself, he said, it's nothing that I did. There was nothing that I could do to change him. I did not expect to see you all in 24 hours. I did not think he would make it overnight. So it was all God. Christian was transferred to an Atlanta rehab facility to learn to walk again. 
pretty challenging, but I worked through it. And I was tired some days, but I worked through it. It means a lot. I'm very happy and blessed. I couldn't do this without the man above. It brings chills to my body. And I can not say I am closer to God. I love going to church now. I just love, I love praying. In May of 2021, Christian graduated from Tennessee State with an interdisciplinary studies degree. Today, he's bringing awareness to traumatic brain injuries through the Christian Abercrombie Foundation. Christian says he's thankful for praying parents. I appreciate them and I love them. I just want to thank them for the support and prayers. Without them, I don't know where I'd be. It could have been a different outcome to this, but I appreciate them so much. His parents credit his recovery to the power of prayer. While we're thinking that God is preparing him to be this um, overall number one draft pick in the NFL, that may not have been the plan all along. He was preparing him for this part of his life. When we wake up right now, I feel like every day I hit the lottery, you know, that's how happy I feel as far as how God has blessed us. My perspective on life have changed. Um, my faith has been built stronger. Um, I just feel as though, you know, without prayer, nothing is possible. But with prayer and with God, all things are possible. Prayer is the key that opens up the possibility for miracles. It's the prayer of faith. It's the prayer of believing. It's the prayer of thanksgiving. I've learned that it's thanksgiving that opens up the pathway. God inhabits the praises of his people. And when you come to him expecting a miracle, when you come to him thanking him for the miracle, wonderful things will happen. Here's a story from the Bible, and it has to do with a Gentile woman who had a demon-possessed daughter. And she comes to Jesus, and he, he rejects her. He, he doesn't even acknowledge her. And, you know, he, he says to her, it's, it's not good for the children's bread to be given to the dogs. If you think that you're not good enough, that you're not qualified, I, I encourage you, think again. Do exactly what she did. What did she do? She started to worship him. And then she said this great statement of faith. But even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. Come to him. If you think you're going to be rejected by God, think again. Come to him and ask him with faith, believing, praising him, worshiping him, acknowledging the greatness of his power. Miracles flow through that. Flow through that. God's looking for faith. The eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth. That means they're looking over you right now, over the whole earth. And he wants to show himself strong to whom? To those whose hearts are loyal to him. So be loyal, worship, and realize your miracle is just a prayer away. Now, Terry and I are going to pray for you. Before we pray, we want to encourage you. Here's some other miracles. Here's Tom. He wrote this in by email. Thursday, March 31st. I was sitting in a clinic waiting to be called for a blood test. TV was on, and so was the 700 Club. Terry was praying about someone with pain on his face. She grabbed the right side of her face exactly where I was experiencing a large growth. She said that I was at the doctor's office now. She said that this would dry up and be completely healed with no evidence of it ever having occurred. Well, I said to me, this is me she's praying for. I'm happy to say that a CT scan confirmed a nasty abscess, which has since drained and begun to dry up. It is healing completely. Praise his holy name. Wow, that's awesome. 
Well, here's another one for you. This is Carrie. She lives in Worcester, Massachusetts. Started having excruciating elbow pain about a year ago. She was watching the 700 Club on March 9th of this year. And Gordon, she heard you say, somebody has a right elbow problem. You can actually feel protrusion. It's in one of the bones. God's just healing that. He's taking away all of that soreness, all of that ligament strain, the bursitis, all of that is leaving you now. Just begin to move your right elbow and receive healing into it. God is touching that joint right now. That pain is leaving you. Do it more. Move it more. Receive the healing for that joint. Carrie believed God for healing. She can now move her elbow freely and she has no pain. God is a miracle working God. Let's come to him believing for miracles, praising him for miracles, and let's receive it right now. Lord, we come to you. We come to you with thanksgiving for what you have done, the sacrifice that you've already made, the stripes that have already healed us, the declaration that it's finished. We receive that declaration because you made it for all time. We receive your forgiveness. We receive your healing. We receive your mercy and your love. Do miracles, Lord God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Terry, God's given you something. Yeah, the, um, the, you were just listening to that healing of somebody's face. You have a, a problem with your back molders. There's like a pocket of infection under them that they've not been able to get healed. That God's healing that for you right now. It's just going to dry up and it will be healed. You'll have no more problem. Now, there's someone you're having a problem with the vision in your right eye, and you've gone to an ophthalmologist, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just hearing you have a bubble in your retina. It's like your retina has been pushed out from the back of your eye, and that's causing the problem. God's able to reattach that retina right now. In Jesus' name, be healed. Be made whole. Eyes were made to see. May you see now under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, be healed and be made whole. There's someone else. Uh, you have an issue with uh, your, your digestive system, and God's healing that for you right now. All of the ex things you've been experiencing, the acid reflux, the inability to swallow well, the digestion of your food, healed in Jesus' name. I don't, I don't know if this is the same person, but you, like you have tumors in your esophagus. God's clearing them all out now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful.